Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is great to talk to all of you again. Uh, my guest today is John Mons. He is running for president on the Libertarian ticket, and he has had a banner week. He, uh, well, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you having me on. You, we, we hosted two debates, or we we didn't host them. We um, produced them, and you were in both of them. And I thought you did a stellar job. I thought that you came across very well, and I think that you are kind of the sleeper in this race in that – you know, people, when Amash dropped out, people went to Jorgensen, who they've known for a long time, or they went to Hornberger, who's the internet favorite. But in a runoff race, everybody's second choice has a pretty good shot at being the winner in the end. What? How are you feeling about the race at this point, John? Uh, I'm feeling very, very comfortable. Uh, like you mentioned, for those who might not have me as their first choice, I think I do very well as a lot of people's second choice. So I, I, I do have support across uh, the various caucuses. I get along uh, pretty well with just about everybody. Uh, I think my sincerity comes across and people like the way I present uh, my arguments. So uh, I think we're peaking right now. I think some of the other candidates have kind of fallen by the wayside and uh, we're picking up momentum and, and things are looking really good for us. So let's go back to the John Mons origin story. Tell us about growing up. What kind of family did you grow up in? Was it a political household? And oh. when did you start hearing about libertarianism? Wow. Well, I was born uh, in Detroit, Michigan, native uh, there, middle class background. Um, like a lot of African Americans, it was almost like I was born into the Democratic Party. Really didn't know anything outside of that. Uh, of course, in Detroit at that time, uh, Mayor Coleman Young was very popular, and Detroit has been run for decades by the Democratic Party. So that's kind of all I, I've known. You know, how I found libertarianism was uh, after moving to Georgia. Um, had been politically homeless for a long time. But in the early 2000s, with things that were going on in the country and being married and having our first uh, two children, uh, I wanted to get in politics, at least be involved, be informed, even if it was just as a voter. So I started from scratch. I looked at all the parties in Georgia, Democrats, uh, Republicans, Constitution Party, Reform Party, Green Party, and this party I'd never heard of, the Libertarian Party, I read every single platform. And the one that stood out to me was the Libertarian platform. And it was just so clear on how much uh, freedom they espoused and, and wanted to get society to that I knew I had found a home. This is around 2004. And I, I haven't looked back. I've been active in the party ever since. I've run uh, four previous races, all in the state of Georgia. I've had some success. And, uh, you know, I owe a lot uh, to where I am today, just being involved with the party and meeting some of the, the, the best people I know in this country. What was it about the platform that grabbed you? What are some of the issues that you read about that you were like, wow, this is it? There was the, the whole thing. I mean, how much it emphasized on freedom. And I think we'd naturally growing up uh, pretty anti-authoritarian uh, mm -hmm. as, as kids and society kind of beats it out of us. And, and luckily, uh, it hadn't done that to me. Um, you know, I like being an empowered individual. I like being able to be in control of my own life and make my own decisions. And, and that what, that's what resonated. You know, something that, that I knew I couldn't get with was all the, the rhetoric that the uh, Democrats and Republicans talk about when they lay out their platform. Because they've had the ability to be elected in a lot of offices, it's, it's easy to tell that um, they're just hypocrites. They don't do what they say they want to do. Um, so, you know, joining or being a part of either one of those, you know, was not even on my mind. So you mentioned, you know, a lot of black Americans are Democrats and you grew up that way. And there's a perennial conversation in the Libertarian Party. We need to reach out to more minorities. It's too white. There's not enough diversity. And uh, 
you know, sometimes I, th I think the ham fisted approach is let's put up somebody who's black for president as opposed to let's just be friends with more black people. I, I co-host a podcast with someone named Miss Pat and Dion Curry. And over the last year, we've had a lot of conversations about racial reconciliation. And that has been the best education for me in understanding where the libertarian message falls flat for people like Miss Pat, Dion, you know, who are very democratic leaning. You know, so why, what would your appeal be to, to minorities, to people of color through this race? Is that going to be a focus? Is that one of the selling points of your campaign? Is that, or is that where I'm, I'm not interested in being, uh, talking about that stuff. I'm, I'm want to be the president for all. I mean, I, this is a ham fisted question, but I hope you understand kind of what, what's the appeal or what's the pitch I guess, to black voters, if you're a libertarian? The, the message the same is the same for any demographic. It's freedom. And I think that message, uh, when presented uh, properly, uh, will resonate with an African-American community. You know, I like to talk about the fact that uh, government has not been uh, the African-American's friend throughout history. And there's a plethora of examples. If we, we want to go all the way back to slavery, Jim Crow, uh, black codes. If you want to look at uh, education, and I and not I don't call it public education. I call it government education, um, and how that is uh, not worked very well uh, for uh, my community. So it's it's how you frame the issues. And one thing I love about the Libertarian Party, it, it's not about your race, your gender. Um, you know, your sexual preference. Like any party, we want good candidates. We want good candidates that can uh, present an image that, uh, you know, won't turn people off, that can uh, give a message that resonates. And, you know, that's what I offer. You know, I don't look at myself as the African-American candidate, but I don't run away from it. It's who I am. It's a part of part of who I am. So, um, you know, it's an opportunity for me to reach out to groups that traditionally we haven't had many uh, good inroads at. I was very active in an NAACP, still still a member down here in Grady County. I've been a branch president and I, I know a national board member who's been to my house. We worked on an uh, issue uh, in Grady County together and I've reached out to him. He's and he uh, has informed me that he'd love to get me in front of more branches across the country just to present a, another option uh, to the NAACP membership about you know who are libertarians, what do we believe, and how can we uh, improve things like uh, criminal justice uh, and, and poverty? How will we address the issues that that face uh, that uh, demographic? You know, what do we have to offer? And, and I'm looking forward to doing that. I, and so, you know, we have a great opportunity. I, I look you know, forward to speaking to groups like my fraternity. Um, you know, I've spoken to youth groups. I've been back to my alma mater, Morehouse College, to speak. And the, the message is the same. though. It's, it's freedom for everybody, uh, individual rights and responsibility. Uh, you know, don't look to government for solutions. And I, I think we have a great opportunity this run. So you ran in Georgia three times, you said, and one of them was a statewide race where you got over a million votes. As you go around Georgia and you talked to voters, what are the some of the top issues that resonate with people when you talk to them? Uh, you know, I, I've run four times in, in Georgia. And my first run, for example, was a local school board seat. So I talked about uh, choice, more choice for parents. You know, my background has been I, growing up, I went to private schools. Uh, I graduated from a, a public high school, a government uh, school, and then I went to a private college and I'm a homeschool parent. So I just said, you know, I've been active and in, in seen different ways of delivering education. And the best thing to do is have uh, give parents options. And, and let them decide what's best for their child. They shouldn't be stuck with uh, just going to a government school, especially if that school isn't very, very good. In my county, the entire school system, every school in my system is ranked F 
uh, by the state of Georgia. And, but they, there's not a lot of options uh, that they have. We have no private schools. Some people go over to the, to the county uh, next to us, uh, but I talk about homeschooling. So it, you, you approach uh, any issue um, from a perspective that more freedom works, more uh, individual responsibility works and you know options. So one issue that I had some success when I ran for governor was um, it was a small issue to a lot of people, but it was important to us and it had a very popular support was Sunday sales of alcohol. And that's an example. Georgia still had blue laws. People didn't understand why it doesn't make any sense. So I was able in a debate to get uh, the eventual winner of that race, uh, get Governor uh, Nathan Deal, to commit that if the Georgia Assembly passed a bill allowing for Sunday sales, uh, I got him to say that he would sign it. The previous governor had refused to do so. And I took the position it's, it was popular with the people. It was popular even with the Republican Party. And that if I was elected, I would sign the bill. And I look at that as a, a very pragmatic approach. If there was not a likelihood of me winning, at least I could have some type of effect and show that a libertarian candidate uh, can get in there, you know, fight it with the big guys and, and make an impact. So that's exactly what happened. Uh, good deal won and the Georgia Assembly passed that bill and he signed it. And I like to take a, le a, a little bit of a partial credit for at least bringing Sunday sales to Georgia. And that's how I approach every race. That's how I approach this race. You know, where can we best have impact uh, in, in bringing some, uh, some moving the freedom uh, ball or line down down the road some. So one of your fellow opponents, Arvin Vora, came to Indiana and uh, they were talking about Sunday sales here because that was a big we you know, the Libertarian Party of Indiana was made a big impact and in, in getting that reformed here in Indiana as well. And and he he chastised the state party on on social media saying this is the just these little incremental we need to stand boldly and declare education blah 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 and that it, that seems to be the fundamental disconnect and that seems to be the spirit of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of party de presidential debates that have been had on zoom over the last uh, couple weeks is messaging is approach is you know the pragmatic versus radical thing which i hate labeling it but um you know, that seems to be the approach is how how do you reach out and appeal to normies <laughs> to people who are not libertarians your friends your family with a a bold libertarian approach have you how have you thought about that? How do you approach? Because I, I listened in the debate last night and I was like, okay, he has radical stances. He has radical messaging, but right. he presents it in a very, he presents it in a very pragmatic approach. Is that just from experience? I mean, how did you get to that point? Uh, some of it is experience. Once again, I've, I've been down this road with my four previous races and you, you're exactly correct. You know, I consider myself pretty radical and with that label, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense because when you look at the, um, the libertarian platform, it's all about freedom. And I, I mentioned last night, but freedom in today's world is a radical ideal. And, and I want to be free. I want others to be free. So I consider myself radical. But the approach, I think it has to be very pragmatic. And that's why messaging is so key. You take an issue um, that may seem uh, controversial, and that's one of the differences I had with uh, Judge uh, Jim Gray, is the fact that I, I call for bringing all the troops home, bringing all the drones home, which sounds pretty radical. And that's what he would say. And people aren't going to listen to that. But I say, well, it's how you present it to people. You know, you present the fact that one, you have to attack why we have troops all around, around the world. And, and, and what's the rationale? And the rationale is that it's gonna make us safer. And I disagree. And that's why you have to attack that first. And I say, it doesn't make us safer. If any other country around the world did what we did to us, 
then we would not look at those countries as friendly. We would not look at those countries as our friend and they would be our enemies. And that's kind of, uh, and when you make enemies, that doesn't make you safe. That doesn't make you secure. So that's the argument. I, I turn it around. The other thing we have to look at is that uh, a lot of these engagements have been based on lies. And I think the American public realize that when you talk about weapons of mass destruction, they already know that. When you talk about, you can go in a little bit more detail about the Gulf of Tonkin, whether it's the Vietnam War, uh, whether it's Korea, whether it's uh, the World War II, World War I with the Lusitania, uh, you lay out the facts. Because if you can explain the why we want to do it, I think the how we, we do it uh, will come. And, and people, once you have the, the the support of the American people, then that puts pressure on Democrats and Republicans once again to adopt our position or at least discuss it because that's what we want. We want to be in the game. We want to you know, have a discussion. And instead of saying uh, right now, well, we need all these troops around the world, let's have a discussion on why we should bring them home. And, and that's what taking a pragmatic approach does. Yes, it's radical. But it can change the dynamic and, 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 and force our discussion on other parties. And, and you take that with any issue. Uh, and in the, the uh, Department of Education or, you know, we talk about, uh, uh, you know, ending the federal income tax. You know, once again, that's a radical idea. But you have to explain why uh, you want to do it. And in part of my, my messaging and language that I use, I call the income tax a slave tax. There's no, the, there's no minimums or maximums in the 16th Amendment, you know, that allows government to pretty much, you know, go down to zero or they can go up to 100 percent. So why should government have any authority to take everything that we earn? You know, that makes us slaves. If we can work all day and the government can take everything we have, you make the argument that the country survived without an income tax for over 100 years, probably 150 years. We don't have to have it. And what do we get with the income tax? You know, all we get is more government. We, we get a debtor nation. Uh, so but you, you make that type of argument. You can have a discussion over that. You know, I, I say, you know, is Donald Trump in 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 uh Biden, I want to see them arguing on why we shouldn't end a slave tax. You know, that, that just puts them in a very uncomfortable position, but it does open up the, the discussion to a very radical ideal. Yeah, and I think that's where I break with a lot of the pragmatic crowd, even though I'm from Indiana and I'm, you know, a former member of the cabal with uh, <laughs> you're on We Are Libertarians. So I hope before this interview is over, you denounce Brett Bittner. And uh, Claire never bitten her. Um, <laughs> in, in, and I've learned this from Miss Pat too, she, because she's the most direct, forceful person I've ever met. She just says it like it is. And people appreciate that honesty. They want to know where you're coming from. And the pragmatic approach over time has sort of, we need to be coy about what we believe. We need to be sneaky. And I, that just doesn't work for people. That, that people, want, people want it plain and they want it honest and then they want a plan to get there. And that, I think certainly is uh, uh, is important. Um, so with that being said, let's talk about the future. Um, what are the issues that as you approach the presidential race, what are the top few issues that you want to run on should you get the nomination? There are, you always have to pick issues, one where the Libertarian Party is strong on. One, uh, I mean, two, where... Uh, we destroy the other parties and three, something that'll be popular with the, the public. So once again, the number one issue I have is, is bringing the troops home, bringing the drones home. Cause I, I think one, we have a strong libertarian position on that Two, It separates us from the other parties. That's what they're not talking about. Uh, another issue is ending the income tax. Once again, uh, very popular. I haven't run across anybody and I don't just sit around asking libertarians. I ask family, friends, fraternity brothers, uh, com folks in the community, you know, would you like to end the federal income tax and get rid of the IRS? And to this date, I haven't had anybody, 
anybody that said no. They didn't say, well, what would we do if we didn't have it? They, they're not concentrating on that. They're just concentrating on, I want it to go away. So that's an issue we can have in uh, inroads on. And a third issue I think that we'd be very strong on, of course, ending the drug war, but the, the presidential uh, power to be able to unilaterally issue pardons and commutations. Um, with where the, 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 the view, the public view on medical marijuana, marijuana as a whole across the states and moving across the country, um, legalization, decriminalization uh, is very popular. Um, so why do we have these people in prison? There's over 83,000 federal inmates that are incarcerated because of drug offenses. A lot of them are nonviolent, uh, victimless crimes. And the records of past presidents have been horrible as far as uh, getting these people out of prison. So I think I can go Trump or even in Biden into saying this is wrong. This is a horrible policy to have this many people in prison. And I know as president, that's one of the first things I'll do from day one is reviewing all these cases and starting to get these people out of these cages. Uh, so that's a way that we can have impact because just think of those, the family members of those inmates, the supporters around the country that, uh, and throughout the states that realize this drug war has failed. It's destroyed families, communities. It's fueled violence and crime. And that's an issue that we've gotten it right. The party has gotten it right on drugs from day one. Uh, right now, the Republicans and Democrats are trying to co-op uh, you know, their drug stance and, and, and take us out of the limelight. And I, you know, I won't let it happen. I said that when I first entered the race, I had an interview on an Atlanta radio station, WALK, talking about criminal justice reform. It's an African-American uh, radio station audience. And I said, we've got to start with the drug war. I mentioned the Libertarian Party and how we've got it right for 50 years. I mentioned that fact that the Republicans and Democrats are, are, have all of a sudden come around. And I said, they've come around because we've been fighting this fight for so long. And, and, and that's what we have to do. We don't we shouldn't uh, equivocate. You know, we shouldn't have had uh, an approach where we're going to be light on drugs and you know, over the 50 years and we're just going to take our time. We've been bold. That's what we need to do and let them come around to our position. We shouldn't weaken our, you know, we shouldn't weaken where we stand and how we present where we stand. So one of my big critiques of the Johnson campaign was strategy and just preparedness for the job. You know, I, I found it a little curious that you know, when asked on 60 Minutes, who would be in your cabinet? Bill Weld had to bail out Johnson his second run. He didn't quite have an answer. Uh, you know, he didn't he didn't seem to have a lot of plans. And then they had this strategy of trying to win one state, you know, instead of kind of running everywhere. Should you be the nominee? What are your plans to message preparedness for the job? And then also, what would be your strategy uh, in terms of winning the presidency? Well, I, and I've talked about this in several of the debates, uh, all 50 states. My strategy is to work with the leadership of every state. Being involved with the uh, LP, uh, Georgia, XCOM, I know that's where the, 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 the sausage is made. It's, it's ground and everything. It's on the state level and the local level. So I don't want to be a top-down candidate. I want to be bottom-up. And the way you do that is you reach out to every state because I don't know their needs. Um, you know, I don't want to be a candidate that dictates what I'm going to do for Georgia. I'm going to ask Georgia, what can I do for you? What do you need your nominee to do in Indiana and in Kentucky and Arizona? Then we can have a regional plan that we can hit events, say, in the southeast or the, the uh, northeast, hit multiple events. We'll coordinate that with the leadership. With, with the team and go out to you know every state. And that's another difference you know, I had with uh, Jim, Jim Gray was he was, well, we need to concentrate on five states and really make an inroad. Well, what do you say to the other 45 states? <laughs> you know, uh, you don't matter or those down, down ballot uh, candidates. So, you know, that's my approach. But uh, messages 
is is key. Once you know, I've already created a short list for Supreme Court uh, nominees. One of my favorites is Scott Bullock. You know, he works uh, with Institute for Justice, and it's an organization that's solid. They do a lot of work with civil uh, forfeiture reform and uh, licensing. They've been to the Supreme Court. They've argued cases. So it's several of their attorneys that that are on the short list, and and you put that out there. So it's not just for them. It's not just, you know, good strategy for the campaign, but you promote uh, organizations that are doing the work and they should get some recognition. So in doing that, if somebody goes to the Institute for Justice and say, hey, let me check out, you know, what the Scott Bullock guy is all about and what the Institute, Institute for Justice is, you know, that that helps us. You know, maybe they get some more donors and things like that. So, uh, you know, that's the, the strategy. You have you have to be uh, prepared and and you know, to hit any question and all that stuff. And nobody's perfect. Everybody's going to make mistakes. You know, as a candidate, we all do. And and that's why, you know, I don't, you know, I hate to see that Johnson didn't have as much success or was tripped up, but I understand it. Um, it, it may happen to me as a nominee or any nominee. You know, a lot of people are out there just to do that, just to trip you up. Um, but you, you got to keep a level head and, and, and keep it moving. You make a mistake, you recover and keep moving forward. But I'd, I'd like to get when a, a presidential candidate and that's one thing I don't believe in uh, duplicating what Democrats and, and Republicans do. But one thing I think they do right is their nominees or the president or elected officials, they go out and support their candidates. And that's what we need to do. We need to do it all over the country because that way the down ballot candidates, uh, they get noticed, they get press, you, you get coverage. And the best way to do that is going out to these, the various states, not just, you know, doing a press conference or, or, you know, just trying to get on the news or something like that, but going out locally. Yeah. That was always my, fr I met judge gray a lot of times in 2012 because it, at the time, 10 years ago, Indiana in 2012 was a powerhouse state. And we got Johnson to come out one time for a rally at, at a college, but it was like pulling teeth to get them to pay attention to one of their strongest states who, you know, Georgia and Indiana had an executive director, a paid executive director in, in Bittner and Spangle. So we had we had the ability to we had organization. Right. But Johnson campaign was focused on like Utah which their campaign manager lives in Utah. Right. You know, and Russ Verney, who ran Perot and Bob Barr's campaign, it was the same thing. And it just never made any, it, it, that that resonates with me, that 45 states, because, well, here's Judge Gray. Well, Judge Gray doesn't excite, doesn't bring out the local media. Like, uh, you know, so it, it, I don't know. Well, this, this, go ahead. You did a point. And that, that's an example. And I try not to uh, bash <laughs> other candidates, but in Georgia, in 2016, we were, we were all set to have a, an event. Uh, it was gonna it was gonna raise us a ton of money, and it was gonna be good for the the Johnson campaign. It was gonna be good for us, and we could not lock down a commitment to get them to come to Georgia, and and that's something you know. So I've seen that once again being involved in in the XCOM. Um, that's not something I would do. I, I want to help. Uh, you know, I want to to build strong uh, organizations across the country and, and hit the states. And, and that's why it's important to work with the leadership. What, what do you need me to do? You need me to be there. OK, let, let's make it happen. So that, that's yeah. I'll, allow me to editorialize. This is not the opinion of John Mons, but <laughs> the, the, the strategy of Barr and Johnson campaigns, both of whom I supported and both of whom I voted for proudly. This this strategy of let's go after two states to win an electoral college vote to throw it into the house like that's that's sort of a pipe dream like we have no structural organization across the United States like build the organization and then that stuff will come and yeah so I I, I agree with that um one thing let me add this before you move here. on here's a di different strategy and one I plan on doing in going out to these states I know how important it is uh, just to can we win a county in, in each state. My thing is any state that I go to is this, be the, have the strongest freedom message out there. And I think that'll be easy looking at who the, who the opponents are. And, and at the closing of every event, say this, is there any county in the state of Georgia 
that will support freedom? Is there any county in Indiana that truly believes in freedom and will show it by getting out to the ballot box and helping us win a county in your state? You know, messaging like that. So instead of trying to win a whole state, can we win 50 counties across the United States and use that to build a base to build a party? That's uh, just a different approach. Yeah, here in Indiana, it's every county but Henry. <laughs> joke for our boss hog friends. Um, but briefly, because we're running out of time, and I want to ask you, uh, I want you, you to give your final pitch here, but you mentioned holding events, and that's pretty hard in a pandemic. Uh, just what's your plan B in case you're not able to travel and, and hold events? Uh, once again, it's not top down. You know, what do I need to do for Indiana? You know, how, but is it, is it, are we going to still be doing online? That's fine. I'll, I'll have them set it up however they want to do it. Uh, same across the nation. Um, you know, it's just easier that way because you can't, I don't want to be a central planner. You know, I, I want to, you know, force this out uh, and let everybody else come up with their plan. Because what works in Indiana might not work in uh, Washington State or New York. Uh, you know, what's best? Some some uh, states might open up to events more than others. So in, in those that are open, let's do events if that's what needed. Uh, and the ones that haven't, let's do it online. All right. So final question here. Uh, it's more of a prodding statement. Give us your closing pitch to all Americans, not just Libertarian Party delegates who will uh, cast their token for the final debate tonight and then possibly vote for president on Saturday uh, on an online convention, not just to Libertarian delegates, but to all Americans. What is going to be your pitch? Well, is this. You cannot have a free country without free people. And I'm not talking about rhetoric of whether you stand for the flag or, you know, or give some type of event, you know, praising how free we are. We have to look at, are we truly free? Does the, with the government closing down and nationalizing basically the entire economy, putting people under house arrest, is that, some, is that what America is all about? I'm a descendant of slaves from Georgia. And that's not where I want to go. I don't want to, and it's not about one segment of the population. It's about the entire population and whether we want what we continually have or do we want something different? Do we want something better? And what I bring to the table, I think, is a message of freedom that will resonate with the people. And it's not just for libertarian, it's for everybody. All right. Your website is mons2020.com. If you want to know more about John Mons, please go check him out there. Follow him on social media. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know that your time is very precious. So this was uh, this was an, a hard ask knowing what all you've got to do. So thank you for spending the time with us. I, I appreciate it. And, and for your listeners out there, um, that's, there's still time to get some debate tokens in, I believe. And and. Um, on Saturday, I'd love to be your first choice. It, it'd be great. To, let's get this thing over with and start working. <laughs> uh, percent plus one on that first ballot. But if not, if I'm not your your first choice, uh, I'd love to be your second choice. Uh, you know, I have broad support across the different factions of the party. Uh, you know, the image that I portray, I think, uh, has served the LP well. I would debt of gratitude to the LP for helping me in my life and making it better. And uh, that's that's what I want to do moving forward. So thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. And, and uh, you know, we'll see you talk to me after Saturday. You don't mind if I come back, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you're you're always welcome here. Uh, win, lose or draw. Feel free to feel free to reach out to us. You've been friends and a fan for a long time since uh, the, the 2000s. So uh, best of luck to you. Thanks, Chris. Take care.